Hello, I'm Neil Howell, and I'm here tonight as part of the Shelf Life Books Writers at Home series. I'm going to be reading to you a short selection from my debut novel, Only Pretty Damned. Um, before I get going here, let me just thank Shelf Life Books for letting me be a part of this cool thing, and also my publisher, New West Press, for putting this out in the first place. So Only Pretty Damned came out about two years ago around this time in those good old pre-plague days that I'm sure we're all longing for. It's a messy, miserable noir novel that takes place in a traveling circus that's working its way around North America in the early 1950s. We get the whole story from Toby, who is a former headlining acrobat, and because of his role in an unfortunate incident at his circus, Toby's been grounded and relegated to the role of clown. So he's stuck watching every night as Genevieve, his former performing partner and lover, uh, continues to headline the show with the new man in Toby's position. Toby's got a bit of a chip on his shoulder because of this, and after certain events transpire, he decides that he needs to take matters into his own hands to right the wrongs that he feels the circus has dealt him. And in doing this, some of the rather sketchy details from his past start to seep to the surface. We start to get an understanding as to why he's such a bitter curmudgeon, and a lot of this has to do with his relationship with a carny named Wally Jakes. The narrative takes place in 1951 predominantly, but there's certain sections that dip back into the 1940s during the war years. So the selection I'm going to read you right now is in one of these kind of flashback chapters, okay, back in the 1940s. So at this point, Toby isn't a clown. He's still a headlining acrobat. The days of moving the whole show by train were slowly creeping to an end. Many of the big shows had already turned their backs to the tracks, but Rollins was a circus that embraced change the way a stepchild embraced his new father's rules. You hold out until you're whipped into submission. That night in Ottawa was our last engagement before yanking the pigs and hauling off to Toronto. And while Genevieve and I autographed photos and told children that if they drank their milk and listened to their parents, they too would someday be able to fly through the air like we did, the ring crew was scrambling to take down the big top and get everything loaded onto a train car so we could all split. Everyone who wanted an autograph got one. Genevieve would sometimes go a little further and stamp a big red kiss next to her signature, but she'd only do that for the younger ones. Hand in hand, we walked back to our trailer, navigating through a buzzing throng of riggers. Wally was normally in the thick of everything, barking orders and insulting the work ethic of everyone in earshot, but that night he wasn't tearing down with the rest of the crew. Being the multi-talented guy he was, there were about a hundred different places he could have been at that moment. I wondered if maybe he'd spotted a new guy not pulling his weight and decided to drag him away from the group and tear a real strip off of him, an occurrence not at all uncommon. But as we neared our trailer, I spotted Wally and Roland standing off to the side, in the shadows. I could only catch a bit of Roland's profile, but he was clearly very angry. His face was all scrunched up and his hand motions were vehement and accusatory. Wally, on the other hand, oozed complacency. He stood with his arms crossed, a toothpick rolling from side to side between his smirking lips. I did my best to look straight ahead while we moved past them, watching them in my periphery in the voyeuristic way you watch a bickering couple have at it in public. Roland was whisper-yelling, but I couldn't quite make out what was being said. As we passed them, I caught Wally shooting a glance my way. I didn't turn to face him, but I could tell he was looking at me. From the corner of my eye, I saw his smile grow just a little. I don't care for that man, Genevieve proclaimed the instant I shut the door behind us. Roland or Wally? Both, I suppose, she shrugged. She kicked her boots off. We only wore our boots when we were grounded, always performing in our bare feet, and walked over to the kitchen area, retrieving a damp sponge. So many of Genevieve's maneuvers depended on her ability to grip with, or to be gripped by, her legs, and she had recently taken to chalking her calves as well as the area behind her knees. She took a seat on the edge of our bed, and with the sponge began wiping the chalk from her legs. They both give me the creeps, she said, looking up at me, but more Wally than Roland. Roland is an oddball, but he's always been good to me. But that Wally? What a vile individual. He's a bit much sometimes, I agreed, but when you get to know him, he's not so bad. And he's always got the show on his mind, always doing what's best for the group. It's hard to hate a guy who's got your best interests in mind. I never said I hated the man, Toby. There's just something about him that bothers me. He's got this look in his eyes all the time. 
I see it whenever he's talking to someone. It's like he doesn't just look at you. He, he sizes you up like he's trying to spot a weakness. It's so unsettling. I shook my head noncommittally, then went to fetch a towel for her legs. I didn't think she was right about Wally. It wasn't necessarily a weakness he was searching for. The look Genevieve was talking about was probably nothing more than a creepy stare, something he was either born with or developed over so many decades of poor socialization. What Wally was after was dirt. The guy was like a damn vacuum cleaner. He collected dirt, as if it nurtured him. Any dirt he could get was an angle he could work, something to keep up his sleeve, to exploit when he best saw fit. She made quick work of toweling her legs and then untied her hair and rolled onto her side. Against her cream pillowcase, her freed hair looked like a whirling well of India ink. I took a seat on the bed with her and rested my hand on her hip, on the border between her costume and her skin. Genevieve's costume matched mine in color, but stylistically it was entirely feminine. It was cut similar to a woman's bathing suit, leaving her legs, arms, and shoulders exposed. She opened her mouth to let out a lioness's yawn and nestled further into her pillow. I wonder what Wally and Roland were going on about, she said, closing her eyes, her voice the resigned mutter of one who was given in to the nagging persistence of sleep. Slowly, I rubbed my hand up and down her, her leg. Yeah, I wonder that myself. She replied with the faintest murmur, and I imagined my voice falling as a whisper from the swirling skies of her dreams. All right. Uh, so that's all I'm going to read uh, for now. Thank you again for listening, for checking this out. Once again, the book is called Only Pretty Damned. And thank you again, Shelf Life. This has been much fun, and I didn't even have to leave my basement to have said fun. So check and check. Take care. Have a good night. Goodbye.